this year's Weldon Conference. Uh, this is the sixth uh, welcome that I've offered for a Weldon Conference, and for many of you in the room, especially some of the members of our commission, I know you've been to many conferences even before that time. But for others, it may be your first time. And you know that we sponsor at the commission, we have many convenings throughout the, the year. But the Weldon Conference is really our hallmark event, our opportunity to bring together people from around the state who have a strong commitment to improving Indiana through higher education. Uh, we believe we have the right people in the room, and we're going to talk about what we think is the right plan as well. And I know this year will be no exception to the great progress we've made at the conferences in the past. So welcome. Uh, some of you had the opportunity to be with us yesterday for the State of Higher Education Address. I apologize in advance for being redundant about a few things, but this day is focused on what we focused on yesterday, which is the Commission's new strategic plan, Reaching Higher, Delivering Value. We spent most of the time yesterday talking about that, with one exception, one important exception, and that is we began the day by honoring Dennis Bland, uh, the, chairman's chair the chairman of the commission, and we were able to provide to him the Sagamore of the Wabash. For those of you who weren't there, it was just a very touching moment as Dennis shared with his family and members of CLD some thoughts as well. So if you'll join me today, I know Dennis is in the room somewhere, I believe. I know he's here. If he's not here now. When you see him, please extend your thanks to him for the contributions he's made to our state. They've been extraordinary. Um, we're going to talk today about the new plan, Reaching Higher, Delivering Value. And it's really going to be the Commission's plan between now and 2020 to focus on what we need to be doing. And that will be the theme of today's meeting as well. Uh, yesterday, I highlighted some of the accomplishments that we've had in our, in our former plans. As you know, 20, 2008, we had Reaching Higher. 2012, we had Reaching Higher, Achieving More. And today, we're going to dive into the details of our new plan, the complexities of higher education in 2016, and the opportunities we have to really create a world-class system of higher education in Indiana. Uh, just a little bit about how the day is going to run. Uh, I'll make a few comments at the beginning to sort of tee up the conversation for the day. And then we're going to have a keynote address focused on the critical role that post-secondary education plays in driving innovation in our businesses, in higher education, and in the state's economy. After that, we'll have some breakout sessions, followed by lunch with Governor Mike Pence. After lunch, we'll have a, a second series of breakout sessions. And then we'll get together for just a brief overview of what we've sort of learned throughout the day. Uh, the breakout sessions will be facilitated conversations in which we encourage you to be full participants in every way. This is our opportunity to think together out loud and, and think about ideas that we have that we could, could improve higher education in the future. The sessions will be focused on the major sections of the strategic plan, uh, completion, competency, and careers. I hope you've had an opportunity to look a little bit at the new strategic plan. If not, you'll have an opportunity to do it throughout the day today. The new plan um, was really, as I mentioned, adopted. It's an evolutionary plan based on earlier plans. So we're not turning the page completely on what was in the past, but we're building on those strategies that we had in the past. Um, at the heart of the, of the plan that we're presenting to you today are the same three guiding principles that, that have been guiding our work in, in, the, in recent years, and that basically is to build a student-centered, mission-driven, workforce-aligned system of higher education. Why is that so important? Uh, building a student-centered system of higher education at a time when we're seeing dramatic changes in student populations, in demographics, and having the student at the center of our work will continue to be our focus. But of course, we recognize that we have a very, very wide, uh, and we're blessed with a wide range of institutions in Indiana, and that each have different missions, and they serve different students, from uh, public and private to uh, we have public universities, we have small liberal arts colleges. We look at the whole landscape of higher education and really look at their missions as we build this system. And of course, more than ever, we're talking about a workforce-aligned system of higher education. How do we know what students have learned and will be able to apply into the world of work so that when they leave higher education, they're fully prepared to have meaningful careers as well? 
these goals really are our focus as we really continue to work on the 60% goal. And I know I'm speaking to the choir here today, and that is that we've all understand that the reason we have a 60% goal is that we need 60% of our Hoosiers who have a quality degree or credential beyond high school by 2025 to meet the workforce needs. We've made progress in that 60% goal, but I think I want to say at the very beginning that we still have much work to do. Uh, just this week, uh, Lumina Foundation came out with this year's A Stronger Nation, which talks at the national level about how, the, how we are doing in education attainment in this country, and then they disaggregate that information by state and actually go so far as to disaggregate it by county within the state. Uh, and so we're able to tell how we're doing. We've improved about two percentage points in that goal. We're at about 36% in Indiana. And now, for the first time, as I mentioned yesterday, Lumen has included an estimated number of credential certificate earners as well. And when you factor that in, it would add about five percentage points, which would bring us to about 41% in our attainment. And remember, we're talking about a 60% goal by 2025. So we have much work to do, but I think it's important to say that we have made progress and that we're going to continue to focus on, focus on what we can do to change those numbers. Um, and so if you look at our strategies for reaching higher delivering value, you will notice that the very first one is the same one that we had in 2012, and that is completion. We know that we must stay focused on getting more students to complete their degrees or credentials. It's their hope, it's our need as a state to have them do that. The core strategies under reaching higher delivering value for completion will be looking at affordability, and we have sections on how do we actually rein in college costs and make sure that a time when we're telling Hoosiers that education beyond high school is more important than ever, that they can, in fact, afford to access higher education. But they have to be ready to go to college, too. <clears throat> and so we have sections about the partnership we have with K-12 and making sure that more students are college ready. I highlighted yesterday uh, some of those numbers of the number of students who leave uh, K-12 still in need of remediation. The most troubling, of course, is that two-thirds of students who get the general diploma in high school need remediation when they get to college. That's simply unacceptable, and we must be focused on college readiness. One of the things I talked about that in that regard and that I hope you'll talk about today is the need for students to, to take and complete four years of math to be college ready. <clears throat> and then we're talking about student support, all the ways in which we're wrapping our arms around students, building an ecosystem that really is focused on student success that when they actually enter college. Um, we're going to continue to measure our progress. Uh, by our, all the reports that we put out. I hope that those in the room find those reports helpful. Uh, in just a few days, we'll be coming out with our college readiness reports again. They actually follow students as they enter college. How many are prepared? How many need remedial work? We now include information about how many persist in college, how many enter college with dual credit. It's a treasure trove of information for those of you who are actually following data. And so those college readiness reports will continue to be important. We'll continue to put out our college completion reports, which follow the work that we're making in terms of getting more students to complete on time. But we understand that our attainment numbers will also include students if they take longer to complete. So we actually follow transfer students and students who take four or six or eight years to complete college. But we want them to complete on time whenever possible. So those college readiness reports are important, as are return on investment reports where we try to really focus in on how much it costs to go to college, how much debt uh, you would incur, what the majors are that students are taking at particular campuses, and what you would be likely to make one, five, and 10 years out. I hope that you know we don't measure success in higher education only by the amount of money that you make in your, in your jobs when you leave. But we also know that students and families need to have a sense of what's out there and what kind of demands there are in the economy. So we'll remain committed uh, to these goals and these strategies as we move forward. Um, but we've introduced some new concepts this time, too. So first, completion. And the second that we're going to talk about, that we've spent a lot of time talking with commission members about in recent months, is the concept of competency. What do students know? And what can they show that they can do? And what kind of assurance can we give to employers that they enter the workforce prepared to do the work? Um, 
a traditional college degree talks about how much time people spent in classes, how many credits they earned. And that's not irrelevant, but it's not the full story. We need to find better ways to show what students have actually learned. Uh, gaining knowledge has always been the purpose of higher education, but it's important that we can demonstrate that knowledge as well. A, a shift to competency uh, will actually require us to think very differently about a system of higher education, and we want to engage in that with you. So as we determine how we fund higher education, how we provide financial aid to students, how does this whole concept of competency work? We're going to have some of those discussions with you today. And you're looking at this in very different ways. You know, as I mentioned yesterday, again, there's no one way to look at competency. And we want to do this in a comprehensive way. Um, and then finally, I think competency really marries right into the last section of our report, which is career alignment. Uh, and what are the strategies to actually make sure that students are more prepared to enter the world of work and have meaningful careers throughout their life? So intentional career planning is important. Starting even before you get into college, when you're in high school or when you're in eighth grade, what are you thinking about careers? We know people won't necessarily know exactly what they want to do, but they start to think about the range of opportunities that are out there. And we need to much more intentionally integrate workplace experiences into both high school and college curriculums so that more degrees and programs actually expose students to the world of work while they're still in school. No surprises when you leave. Not this uh, study that showed that 50% of people would pick a different major or college if they would do it over again. We want to make sure that that's not the case, that people enter into their jobs fully aware of what they're going to do, and that employers have that assurance as well. And that means that we need employers to really step up and be full partners with us in this work in a way that we've never seen before. Um, this idea of internships requires employers to really recognize the value of internships as well. Um, we know that we talk a lot about the brain drain. One of the best ways to stop the brain drain is for students to have an opportunity to actually have a quality internship, and it's one of the best ways for that student to get a job as well. Uh, Ryan Palmore, Ryan, would you stand up? I think I see you over there. Ryan uh, works at the Commission for Higher Education, had an internship with us. We had an opportunity to see him at work, and he had an opportunity to decide whether he liked the commission. Thank you, Ryan. And that's what we need more people to do. We've hired, even in a small office like the commission, we've hired many interns. Uh, we highlighted a company yesterday called DECO, um, and many of their upper-level uh, um, employees were actually people who started at DECO as an intern. We need that to be more the case. Um, the challenge is that um, too few Hoosiers actually understand or how they can make these workplace experiences for them work, and we need to help them do that. And we all have a part to play in that. Colleges, the state through financing, colleges through the uh, programs they provide, employers by stepping up, and then, unless I left them, I don't want to leave them off the hook, students really need to take advantage of the opportunities that we're providing as well. Um, I want to also mention in, in my uh, concluding remarks, I think an exciting new uh, adventure that we're under at the Commission, and that is the creation of the first in the nation Indiana College Value Index. Uh, we have some um, early results of the Gallup Indiana Index uh, that we'll highlight throughout the day today, but the Indiana College Value Index will be our attempt to take all of our reports, our college readiness, our college completion, our return on investment, and the Indiana Gallup Index, which is out talking about graduate satisfaction, what about your college experience really helped you in life? And we're going to integrate the qualitative and quantitative metrics of higher education into an Indiana College Value Index. Um, I know it's going to be a tough thing to do. No one else has actually ever really done this. But as I mentioned earlier, it's not a, just a matter of dollars and cents about higher education. It's about how that experience translated into a meaningful life for you. And we want, to take, we want to really try to get ahead of that and talk about all of these things. So uh, Indiana's new strategic plan is really focused on making sure that we get more students to complete and whenever possible to complete on time, to make sure that they are able to show what they've learned and what they can do, and that employers work with them to provide opportunities for them to have work-based experiences in high school and college. I think we'll be really prepared to focus uh, on the needs of the 21st century if we really follow through with this plan. 
So I want to thank each of you in the room today because you are full partners in this effort. I always say a strategic plan is really words on a page. It comes to life at the colleges and universities where you do the hard work. And in this case, more and more we're asking the employers to join in with us. So now I'd like to turn to uh, our introduction of our keynote speaker for this morning. Uh, Mike Langelier is the president and CEO of TechPoint. I think everyone in the room is uh, familiar with TechPoint. It's a statewide initiative focused on supporting growth in Indiana's tech sector. We're seeing uh, great strides in this sector, and it's in more important than ever that we have a vibrant tech, uh, actually tech sector in the state of Indiana. Um, Mike's a perfect example of what we're going to be talking about today. He launched his own business and eventually sold a successful tech company, My Jibe, and then he, and he served in several leadership roles in financial and tech-focused companies before taking the lead at TechPoint in 2012. His own experience as an employer and his current work with Indiana's growing tech companies make him acutely aware of the need for great talent, human capital, equipped with the right skills and knowledge. He's a graduate of an Indiana school. He graduated from DePauw, and he's a past OR entrepreneurial fellow. Uh, we need to spend a lot of time looking at those or, that OR fellowship. It's a great way to get students who leave to have some opportunity in their first jobs to then take that experience and change the, the economic landscape of our state. He understands the value of higher education and career exploration. He's very invested in advancing Indiana's economy and quality of life uh, in his work and in his personal life. He serves on the board of the Star Financial Bank, the Central Indiana United Way, through our fellowship, and the Tech Point Foundation for Youth. I think he's the ideal speaker to highlight the real-life application of our strategic plan for higher education, the challenges we face, and the, re and the rewards if we succeed. And did you notice, and you will notice when he comes to the mic, he's probably the youngest speaker we've ever had as a keynote speaker. It's about time that we got into the younger decades. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Mike Langelier. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Lubbers, or as you're quick to correct me, Teresa. Uh, thank you for your leadership as well uh, toward ensuring that the classroom experiences of current and future Hoosiers point toward meaningful career opportunities and a lifetime of success. So I'm sorry to any of you who are attending expecting to see Kevin Carey speak about the findings of his book, The End of College, Creating the Future of Learning and the University of Everywhere. I am not him. As, as Commissioner Lubbers referenced, um, Kevin had a family health matter that prevented him from being here. Um, but I hope that I can, in this role, be able to share some, a few things. One, inspiration. Um, some ideas from other industries of exciting things that are working um, that could be, rele could be relevant in other industries and that we could apply in other contexts, uh, including higher ed. And I, that I hope that together, I love this format of the working sessions. Uh, in between the talk tracks that we could grapple together with some big problems, some big opportunities as well that are amongst us now. So I think it's always helpful uh, before a person speaks to understand the lens through which uh, they are looking uh, so that as you hear their remarks, you can filter it through that lens as well. Uh, Commissioner Lovers touched on many of those things, but here's my lens. Um, I'm a farm boy from rural Illinois who had the good fortune to receive a great educa education at an Indiana school, DePaul University. I'm here in Indiana because of the OR Fellowship, as Commissioner Lubbers referenced. Uh, it was instrumental in my life for many, many different reasons. Those of you not familiar with the program, it recruits and grooms the next generation of business leaders in Indiana. Um, I was, I was a, one of the, the lucky that was a part of that class. I was lucky for a couple different reasons. Not only was it a launch pad for my career, but I also met my wife through the program. Uh, and we have uh, three little boys uh, here in Indiana now. Um, now, I'm, I'm on the uh, board of directors for which I've interviewed. One of our responsibilities in that program is to interview candidates each year. And so through that program, I've interviewed hundreds of candidates from your schools and have been able to see a lot of them at their formative stage in their career, which has been very exciting and very impressive both. 
um, worked for a large global company, which is a learning experience in its own, um, and then also started from scratch a startup company that we sold, as Teresa said, a, uh, a, about four years ago to a company out west. I took a hiatus from private companies and said yes to the opportunity of TechPoint because I felt compelled to make an impact on the place. And I believe that we are at a unique moment to do that here in Indiana. Uh, I'm feeling a change happen in the last several years. In particular, I'll, there, there are several of those in my world. You may have heard about companies like Aperio that started headquartered in San Francisco, have moved their headquarters here, and now have their largest office. Companies like Imarsis, a European company that chose to have its North American headquarters located here. Companies like Geofedia that were in Florida and in Chicago and now have their largest office here in Indiana too. The thing that I, is pivotal about that is that this is the first time that I believe, particularly in an industry like this, where we hear of companies that are making decisions to locate specifically because of talent. Not because of cost of living, not because it's a less expensive place to operate their business or an easier place to do business, but specifically because they wanted the people that are here. And I think that that is something, that's a snowball that once it starts to turn, that's something that we can take advantage of in much, uh, much larger quantities. And the people in this room are critical to making that competitive advan advantage possible. I also, as I talk with uh, folks and colleagues in San Francisco and Silicon Valley, New York, and even Chicago, people and companies are experiencing immense pressures to their quality of life and to their cost of living. Many of you may have heard that in 2013, the median home price in San Francisco crossed a million dollars. The median home. So a lot of them are grappling with how to, how, to weave, how, to, how to be able to simultaneously have one of the things that we cherish most, most here, which is family, and then also have that desirable career. And as a result, it's caused, causing companies and people to look elsewhere, to look to other communities like those that we have here in our state and so we need to be deliberate and we need to be aggressive about evangelizing the virtues of being here because there are many people that are looking. San Francisco and Silicon Valley, in fact, as I met with my, the, uh, my colleague that runs a civil, similar organization in that space, for the first time in quite a few years, both that area and also New York City net exported talent, domestic talent, from their cities to other places more than what they imported, which is, I think, a dynamic that's that's unfamiliar and uncharacteristic for, for what many of us have experienced in the past. So for those reasons, I'm, ex I'm excited. I'm going to share a snapshot of what's going on in the tech sector in Indiana, and then I'll broaden it, because I think it has applicability to a lot of the industries uh, that our students are going into, and a lot of the companies that are here in the state as well. So hopefully you can see here on the side slides, this is really a growth slide. So one of the reasons why I'm excited and optimistic about the future is just the trajectory of growth. You can see growing at over four times the national average. It's one of two of the occupational, growth, uh, occupational groups that's growing um, faster than the national average. This is specific to Central Indiana. This is a study looking at Central Indiana. But one of the surprising things, and I'll get into this here in a bit, is that the tech sector in the space is much larger than what a lot of us realize. So as we look at at the total workforce, we're talking close to 51,000 people, which, as you see, puts it on par with or even larger than some of the industries that we have historically talked a lot about. And for, what's interesting is that th these workers are going to work, uh, sometimes they'll be, they'll be in IT or in tech, but working in other industries. We talk a lot about... Uh, we talk a lot about wages. We talk a lot about creating the kinds of jobs that are going to create the kinds of lifestyles that we want for Hoosiers. And the average uh, tech wage is, is more than double the, um, the median wage in the state. In aggregate, $7.8 billion in total earnings. And I can't read it on the speaker, but almost $14 billion in gross regional product. As we look at company growth, and we look at where growth is happening among companies, Inc. 500, many of you are probably familiar with, it's the barometer of where company growth happens. A lot of the, the emerging companies are cataloged in this. In, in, their, uh, uh, in their reports every year, 20%, by far more than many of the other categories of those Inc. 500 companies, are in IT 
and by far most of them are in, in uh, high tech. If we look at where growth is likely to happen, one of the barometers is venture capital investment. Venture capitalists are actively investing in places where disruption is happening, opportunity w will be in the future. And what we see in 2014, uh, over half of the dollars and over half of the, the venture capital deals that were uh, invested in nationwide were in tech. Software by far being the greatest. And interestingly, EdTech is, is an area of sig significant investment. In 2015 alone, $2.5 billion of venture capital invested into companies that are innovating and disrupting in the education technology space. So, you might be thinking, Mike, this is tech, this is one kind of lens of our, of our economy. Uh, what cross relevance does it have? And this is something that some of you may have, may have um, read the article in, I believe it was the Wall Street Journal back several years ago, that was about software is eating the world. And as a result, technology and the impact that it's having in all, in all of our industries across the state. This is an example of that. So what is tech now? As, as it's permeating everything, sometimes it's hard to put, pin down what exactly it is and what impact it's having on our economy. We break it into three categories. Tech product companies that are selling a product or a software to the marketplace. Companies like Salesforce, HC1, Teradata, Interactive Intelligence. Tech service companies that are selling their people's time and their people's expertise to the market. IT services company, managed services companies like Fort Wayne IT Solutions, Aperio, which I referenced earlier, Kinney Group, Apparatus. And then tech enabled companies, which is increasingly everybody else. So increasingly, all these other companies are also becoming tech companies, also becoming IT companies. They're relying on computing. They're relying on uh, their telecommunications and the internet. They're relying, on, um, uh, they're relying on data in order to be able to create competitive advantage for themselves and to be able to sustain their businesses. Companies like Angie's List, Cummins, Lilly, Anthem, Cook, etc. So for these reasons, uh, as we look at tech jobs across the state, one of the couple interest, a couple things that may be of interest to this group, almost 115,000 tech sector jobs in the state. And you may say, is this just an Indianapolis thing? Actually, 50% of the uh, tech jobs are not in central Indiana. 50% of Indiana's tech jobs are not in central Indiana. And the reason why, and the reason why you don't necessarily see that, is because 60% of those jobs are in the tech-enabled companies. They're in companies like Lilly, like Cummins, like Cook, et cetera. They're this category. The, uh, the, the, one of the other things that I want to clarify, too, a lot of times when we talk about jobs in tech, we automatically think about software developers. We think about people who are who are building the, building the software, they're programmers. Uh, that's not the case. That is, they are a huge critical part of this need and they're one of the most acute pain points of jobs in the state. But also, all of these companies, like any of our companies, have lots of other, ha lots of other, other occupations that are part of these companies. And here's a, here's a roster of some of them. We surveyed companies, 58 companies responded to the survey, projecting just over 1,200 internships and new FTEs in 2015. 50% planned hires target new grads less than five years of experience. Another great opportunity as we think about many, many of the institutions in the room, the highest volume that they're educating are, are folks in that kind of 18 to 22 year old category. And then also uh, their jobs like sales, like customer support, analytics, and marketing account for 74% of the 2015 non-tech occupation hiring. So lots of opportunities for people of all different kinds of backgrounds to be able to enter into a very high growth industry and to have successful careers. And here is a view of the demand for some of those companies. This, this list is in order by demand. Sales was in most demand, customer support second, analytics third, marketing fourth. Okay. So we have, where does TechPoint play in this? Um, we play uh, in the middle, which reminds me of the TV show, which coincidentally is about a middle-aged 
middle-aged woman and family in a uh, middle-income family in middle America, namely in Indiana. And that's largely the role that TechPoint plays as well, in the middle between employers and educators as well. And um, in entering into this space, we, we, as we tried to understand the dynamics between the, between the two, there was a gap. There was an obvious gap, and there was a lack of communication. There was a lack of mapping between the college graduates and the job opportunities. So as we, do, as we dove in and tried to understand, how can we help to bridge this gap? How can we help to create a more efficient pipeline, a more transparent talent uh, marketplace between those that are, that are leaving college and those that are going into the workforce? Oftentimes, it felt like this. Can anybody tell me, where is this picture taken from? Anybody? I heard hardware store, not a hardware store. Bed, bath, and beyond. <laughs> I will never forget my first bed, bath, and beyond experience. It was when my wife and I were registering for our wedding, and I've never been back. <laughs> the only redeeming characteristic out of it was that I got to hold the gun. <laughs> But you end up walking through all of these options, scanning items that you don't really know if you're going to use them. And I put myself in the shoes of being a college, you know, going into college. And it's very, you know, very similarly, I've never been married before. I don't know which of these things that I'm going to need. But yet we're scanning things fairly, fairly recklessly with, with, with the kind of the, 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 the perverting uh, characteristic in, my, in, in our head that we're not really going to have to pay for these. <laughs> which I think is something that we can all resonate with as well in the education system with a very complex payer market uh, creates, creates weird uh, incentives and dynamics. We've tried to take what oftentimes felt like this, and I can, I can relate with many of you. It feels like this when you look at the employer market, oftentimes. You see lots of companies in lots of different kinds of occupations, and a lot of times they don't speak very clearly about what they need. They don't use the same language necessarily. Sometimes one year it's one thing, the next year it's another thing. I can totally empathize. And similarly, the employers feel the same way. As they look at the universities, they see this wall oftentimes as well. Because they see, they see, if they're looking for programmers, for, for example, they, they, might be, they might have to go poke around in the School of Science and in the Computer Science Department there. Then they might have to hop over to the School of Technology and also look in the CIT department there. But there also could be other, other departments where there are interesting programs as well, when really at the end of the day, they just, want a pro they just want a programmer. And every one of those has their own career services department, oftentimes. And so it, you end up having to talk to three different people just to try to find the one occupation that you might want. And that's just at one school. I'll get, I'll get into that. We have some more data around that, um, which I hope will be illuminating later on. But that's one of the challenges that, that we experienced, and we, could, we can empathize with both sides, because both sides, it was very complex markets with lots of different players involved, and you're trying to figure out how to map them. So in an ideal world, this is what we find ourselves doing a lot, and what we, what we feel we can do most effectively. We're helping to connect the dots between those companies and, and the, the universities uh, in order to create a consistent, sustainable bridge between the two. Some days it looks like this, <laughs> but we aspire for that. Okay, so let me get specific with an example of what we do. We do a variety of different things in representing the tech community here, the tech ecosystem here, and trying to, tr we're building a market. We're, we're, we're trying to make a dynamic ecosystem where we are infusing the resources into the ecosystem, the companies need to grow, the talent needs to grow and develop, and it is an attractive place on a national and international basis for people to come to. There's a lot of stuff that we have to do. One of the main things that we've built up over the course of the past two years is a very specific focus on talent. And so this is a, I wanted to put the logos up here. Some of you may be familiar with these programs today. If not, please do get familiar with them. The extern program is a, is a college internship program. Um, for high caliber tech talent, the NDX Tech Fellowship is a two-year post-grad, much like the OR Fellowship, which we described before, but the NDX Tech Fellowship focused on product uh, tech talent, but it's a two-year post-grad. And then the expat program focused on connecting back to those out-of-towners that have left the state 
but they're at that stage in life, oftentimes between 25 and 45, where family, having a family, quality of life, cost of living starts to matter, and that's our opportunity to engage them and bring them back, and our, our job board as well. So let me make it tangible. This is our extern program. Let me introduce you to Sally. Indy Extern connects high caliber students to our thriving tech community here in Indianapolis. Companies that participate in our program range from early stage startups to one of the 200 largest software firms in the world. And it's been designed to make sure you have the best summer of your life. First of all, you get to be involved in the Indianapolis community, and you get to see what you know, tech, jobs, uh, environments, work areas, all these things. But then, on the other hand, you get to be involved with other people that also know what you know and love what you love. So students this year lived in four bedroom apartments. Every student had their own apartment, fully equipped, kitchen, everything you would need for housing for a summer. And so this year students lived very close to downtown and the housing is really, really what makes the program so special. And I think that when students talk about extern, now they refer to it as their extern family. And that wouldn't happen if you didn't live together. Being close enough where it's walkable is awesome because there's just a lot of opportunities for exploring and we go to the canal together as groups and, and that brings us back to how great it is to live together because it's easy to meet up. Indianapolis truly has a community that doesn't, simply doesn't exist and can't exist elsewhere. And it's not only a community of peers and friends, but it's building a network that will last far beyond the 10 to 12 weeks of your internship. So I share that with you because I, I hope that it will offer some inspiration to maybe similar industries or similar programs where a similar thing can be done. I share it with you because I want you to share it with your students as well because it's an incredible opportunity for them. Um, and I want to share some of the results as well. We started this program two years ago with help from the wonderful folks at the Lilly Endowment and a dozen companies and more recently and, and a bunch of universities and more recently from Employee Indy and the Department of Workforce Development that have invested to help us scale it. Now this summer, we are going to have 200 of the most talented, uh, skilled and young people from all over the country that are going to be descending into Indiana, into these programs, working at, working at uh, 45 different companies around the region. The really interesting thing is one of the programs, the extern program specifically, there will be 130 candidates, 130 students that will be part of that program. In its second year, again, we, this has only existed for two years, but for those 130 spots, we had over 900 applicants from 58 universities in 16 states and seven countries that applied to the program. And these are some of the hardest, this is some of the hardest talent, the most sought after talent when we go to career fairs to be able to compete for this talent and to, to get them to join this program, we're competing against Amazon and Google and Apple and Facebook, IBM, Microsoft, companies like that. And I share it with you because we're winning. We're beating companies like that because we're offering an experience that they can't. We're offering them a cohort group, a community. We're offering them an opportunity to be part of something that's bigger than themselves. And I'll tell you that with that, as many of you know, with that millennial audience, that's a, that's a message that sells. And it's an opportunity that we, it's an opportunity for us to get over sometimes our flyover, hangover, and to be able to sell the programs and the experiences that we have here. Thank you to all of those who made it possible. 
as we look at the results, we've been measuring sentiment. And so we had 50 in the first class, 108 in the second class, so 158 in aggregate. And we've asked them, prior to the program, how likely were you to stay and work here in Indiana after graduation? And after the program, the same. Prior to the program, only 12% said that they were likely to stay and work here in Indiana. But after the program, 78% say that they are. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. And again, I share that because I know that there's a kernel here, there's a nugget that is applicable to a lot of different communities and to a lot of different industries. And if this recipe can be helpful for any of them, we hope that it is. When Teresa asked me to step in and provide the keynote today, I said yes because I believe that we are at an inflection point in Indiana. And the people in this room today steward our state's most precious natural resource, our talent. Our talent, both those who grew up here and the thousands of others coming from out of state in the country, Indiana is one of the largest net importers of college students. And the people in this room have the keys to do something really extraordinary and set a national example for how to turn our talent attraction, retention, and development efforts into a competitive weapon. That's why I'm excited to be here today. And in doing that, we have a huge opportunity. But we all know that there are also challenges. And I'll share something that Kevin Carey, if he were here, probably would have relayed, relayed from his book. There's an excerpt that reads, colleges in the United States have become, by a wide margin, the most expensive in the world. Since I, he, first enrolled, inflation-adjusted tuition at public universities has more than tripled, rising much faster than the average family income. The only way parents and students have been able to make up the difference is debt. By 2004, Americans owed nearly $250 billion in student loans, which at the time was considered to be an alarming sum. By comparison, outstanding credit card debts then stood at $700 billion, the hangover of a ravenous consumer culture with a taste for easy credit. Over the next eight years, student loan debt quadrupled, passing $1 trillion, leaving credit cards in the dust. The share of 25-year-olds with student loans increased by 60%. In the 1990s, most undergraduates were able to avoid borrowing entirely. By 2012, 71% of students graduated with an average debt of nearly $30,000. Leaving school with swollen loans during the worst economic crisis in generations, many students found they couldn't afford the monthly payments. They put off buying homes because more borrowing was impossible. American students were falling off the path to graduation as well. Less than 40% of students enrolling in the first year of a four-year college actually graduate in four years, even allowing an extra two years for changed majors, illnesses, or other circumstances. Fewer than two-thirds graduate within six years. I know that this is a huge priority of the commission, and we've come a long way. There's, there's obviously great opportunity for us to continue to press ahead. And I think the theme of adding value to the mission obviously speaks to these trends. So some of the other, some of the problems more, more specifically that I've experienced, and then I'll ask Commissioner Lubbers to join me and we can chat about these more impersonally. Many people will ask me, many of you know David Shane, and I asked David Shane, David, what's, what's help me think about what are some of the things that we should drive home most? And he resonated with uh, one of the topics. One of them is liberal arts and skills-based education can't be thought of as two ends of a spectrum. When you ask an employer what they need, it's not one or the other, it's both. And increasingly in the changing landscape that technology and innovation is causing, we hear about Moore's Law and how it has impacted the, uh, the, the semiconductor industry and technology as a result. It's cascading into our, our, enti our entire life. And as a result, we have to have students that are nimble, that are critical thinkers, that can, that can prepare themselves and learn for a job opportunity that doesn't exist today. And that's a paradigm that we've not yet experienced. We used to lock and load a person for the career that would set them on, on a track for the rest of their life, and that's just not possible today. And so we have to think about them both specifically. I come from a liberal arts school, and I know that the temptation has been to both deliver a liberal arts education, but then to offer choice. And that's a very tough balance. It's very tough to deliver the liberal arts rigor with also offering choice to students without it, without it devolving into cafeteria-style education where you're not really sure, you're not able to put the specific controls around the liberal arts rigor. And similarly, 
Skills-based education is difficult because at the, at the speed that the curriculum has to evolve, it's very difficult for the credentialing to keep up with the new technologies, the new expectations, the new work paradigms. Credentials, some, some of you have been pioneers. I see WGU folks over here that have been pushing hard on, on credentials and, and making that very transparent to um, employers. I think that's critically important because one of the things that employers are finding increasingly difficult is that GPA is not a very a transparent indicator of what that person is prepared to do. And so being able to specifically articulate what that, how prepared that person is to be a citizen, how prepared that person is to be a critical thinker, a, a good communicator, but also what specific skills that person has that they could bring to the work, workplace is going to be critically important. The smaller, the, the, the second that I'll reference is smaller and emerging companies increasingly are increasingly significant and important parts of our employer base, but HR is the last function in those companies to develop. And that has a big impact on you um, because that is the, that's oftentimes the interface that you interface with at the companies. And if it's not robustly developed, it's very difficult to create a continuous relationship. I totally understand that. Let me share a stat. So one of our other, uh, one of our other initiatives focuses on scale-up companies. I don't know if that's terminology familiar to a lot of the folks in the room. We hear a lot about startup companies. That new idea, that new product, <coughs> that new business that develops, that first fundraise, the excitement of the first launch. And then, we, and then we know well our anchor companies, our pillar companies as well, because they're very present in our economy. There's this middle tier, though, of companies called scale-up companies that are rapidly emerging. Oftentimes, they're, they're beyond that early st startup growth, but they're still young, typically between 1 and 10 years old, growing at at least 20% a year. They aspire, aspire to be a high-growth company, not just a lifestyle business. Um, and that pr the profile of that company, typically, they're, they're several hundred thousand dollars in annual revenue up to quite a few million, but they're still younger. That is only 2% of the companies in the U.S. economy. But between, between 2009 and 2012, that category of companies created 35% of the new jobs. So for the sake of our economic development, for our economy here, it's a, it's a, it's a subset of our company base that we have to pay attention to and we, we have to make inroads to. But I know that it's difficult because those companies in those companies, those are the companies where the HR function develops last. And as a result of that, oftentimes it's one person or it's two people that it's running the entirety of the HR operation and it makes it difficult to create a pipeline. And that's an area where we need to continue to be able to improve the relationship and that's one of the areas where my organization aspires to be helpful. The other is that the um, we're not effectively steering young talent toward jobs that matter. And this dovetails into the last. As you look at these companies that are rapidly growing, it for, because of their growth, because of, the, because of the raw pressures of having to grow a company um, against the odds, it causes you to focus and prioritize on just the things that matter most. And the, the, the career paths that matter most, the types of occupations that those companies need most desperately are three things. Makers, marketers, and managers. People who can make that product and service, deliver it to the marketplace. People who can market and sell that product, get it into the hands of customers who are willing to pay for it. And then those managers that can lead the product, lead the team, lead the organization in the right direction. We talk a lot about a lot of different occupations. When a, when a student goes to career services and surveys the list of potential careers, it's a mile long. We would be well served to drive these students toward Helping them prioritize toward those occupations, though, they're going to put them in the best stead toward gainful employment and being critical to the future success of the company. And in our eyes, it's into those three categories, makers, marketers, and managers. And then the last thing that I'll share is that new young grads are only part of the solution. A lot of times we'll try to equate what the total workforce gap is and we'll say, we'll, we'll say the workforce gap is this big, we're only graduating this number of students. But in reality, what we hear from companies is that that's only part of the equation. So we ask companies, based on the level of experience, what they're looking for. And only 52% of the surveyed companies are seeking com computer and IT professionals with, uh, this is with five plus years of experience. So about half of the demand is five years or less, about half is five years or more. So those, as we think about the occupational or the educational needs in the marketplace, 
yes, we have to focus on the young talent, but we, we absolutely have to have those educational solutions that are addressing this part of the market as well, the, the, the um, adult market, and helping to upskill those individuals that are in the marketplace today because they are still a huge part of, of the talent pipeline solution for the foreseeable future. With that, I'll end. Thank you.